My Elder Joseph the Hezekist, written by Elder Ephraim, published in 2013 by St. Anthony's Greek Orthodox Monastery, Florence, Arizona, All Rights Reserved. Prologue about this book. Since the repose of Elder Joseph the Hezekist 50 years ago, our Elder Ephraim has continually told us many stories about him. These inspiring stories prompted us to begin collecting them in written form. To do this, we gathered cassette recordings of his homilies and wrote down word for word what he said about his Elder Joseph. Seeing that this collection comprised nearly an entire biography, we decided to complete it by including stories written or spoken by other disciples of Elder Joseph, primarily Elder Ephraim of Katonakia, Elder Harlambos of Dionysio, and Elder Joseph of Atopedi, as well as autobiographical excerpts from Elder Joseph's own letters. Then, to form these pieces into a continuous biography, we merely added a few sentences of our own to make smooth connections between antidotes. The final editing was completed by Father Stephanos A. of Piraeus, who painstakingly reviewed our 700-page rough draft, removed extraneous information, clarified anything obscure, re reworded antidotes that were too colloquial, and summarized redundant statements. Thus, this book is the product of several people's efforts. Nevertheless, we have attributed the authorship to Elder Ephraim, because his words comprise the vast majority of this book. This English edition includes several antidotes from our original 700-page rough draft that had been omitted from the published Greek edition. We also rearranged a few sections and occasionally translated sentences directly from that first draft rather than from the printed version. As a result, this English version presents a more complete biography of Elder Joseph with more direct quotes from Elder Ephraim signed by the Fathers of St. Anthony's Monastery. Section 1. In the World His Early Years His Family Elder Joseph was born in the village of Lefkis on the island of Paros, the third largest island of the Cyclades. The island is known for the marvelous Hundred Arches Church, which was built in the 4th century by St. Helen. It is known also for its renowned Longovardis and Thapason monasteries of the Holy Elder Philotheus Orvacos. The name of Elder Joseph's mother was Maria Rangusis. She was born in Lefkis in 1871. When she was about 17 years old, she married her first husband, Leonardo Zusmis, whose parents were refugees from Odessa, Russia, which is now part of southern Ukraine. Leonardo and Maria had two children, Michael and an infant who died before he was baptized. Leonardo died when he was only 20 years old, and thus Maria remarried in 1890. Her second husband was George Kotis, who lived from 1867 to 1907, an illiterate farmer. He was poor but very pious and extremely modest, and he passed these virtues on to his children. George and Maria had nine children. The first three died when they were young. Maruso, the first, lived until about 1901. Ergina, the first, died before 1896, and another girl who died before she was baptized. The other six lived, and their names were, in order of age, Ergina II, Emmanuel, Francis, Elder Joseph, Leonardo, Maruso II, and Nicholas, the future Father Athanasios. Francis was born on November 2, 1897. In 1907, as soon as Nicholas was born, their father died at the age of 40. Their small house in the village was across from the place where the public library is today. 
Eight small stone steps led to the entrance of this house, which consisted of merely two little rooms, each one about 100 square feet or 9 square meters. In these two rooms lived the parents and their seven children. This is where Francis lived for about 17 years. It is remarkable that so many people were able to live in such a small place, even though it is true that small houses often bring more warmth, togetherness, love, and joy to a family. Today, that tiny house has been changed into a little souvenir shop owned by the grandniece of Elder Joseph. His mother. Elder Joseph's mother, Maria, was truly a godly person, modest with natural self-reproach and a sense of her own sinfulness, gifts that she cultivated in her children. She had simplicity and purity of soul and sometimes even saw visions when she was at church, either during a church service or when she was just there to clean. The day that Francis was born, she had a vision while lying in bed with her newborn baby boy. It seemed to her as if the roof of the house opened up and a young man full of grace appeared. He was so bright that she could hardly look at him. The angel approached the infant and began writing his name on a tablet. Maria wondered what he was doing and inquired with concern, what are you doing there? Why are you writing his name? The king needs him, replied the angel. No, you can't take this baby. He's mine. I'm telling you, it is written, answered the angel as he showed her a list. Since her first children had died young, she surmised that the angel wanted to take Francis prematurely also. Whenever she remembered the angel's appearance, she wept inconsolably with motherly pain. However, as time passed and Francis grew up without dying, she realized that the enrollment meant that the King of Heaven was calling Francis to the army of his earthly angels, to monasticism. On another occasion, she experienced a fearsome vision of hell. As soon as she regained her senses, she said to little Francis, Oh, my child, what have I seen? What did you see, Mama? I saw that I went to hell, and the tormented people were boiling like beans, bopping up and down in a pot. They kept going in and out of a hellfire. She was a simple person. One day when Francis was older, he took her to a movie theater to show her a motion picture for the first time in her life. When the movie depicted a burning room, she thought it was real and started shouting, Fire! Fire! Life as a Child St. Arsenius of the Holy Mountain, who lived from 1800 to 1877, had left a great influence on the island of Paros at the time little Francis was growing up there. St. Arsenios had worked with exceptional zeal as a confessor for the spiritual formation of the people of Paros. The pious people of the island loved him so much that they honored him as a saint even while he was still alive. Another shining example of sanctity that directly influenced Francis and his family was the priest of their village, Father George A., who lived from 1863 to 1929. When Father George served the liturgy, his face changed and became so radiant that people could not look at him. Recalling those liturgies, his chanter later said, What sublime mo moments! We had the feeling that he was seeing saints and that the angels were ministering to him. When he served, no one dared speak to him because they didn't want to interrupt him when he was completely absorbed in prayer to God. When Father George fell asleep in the Lord, his body was fragrant, like the smell of a fine incense, not of this world. It was in this strictly ecclesiastical climate that little Francis was raised. He would remember being young and people telling him, Children, it is great Lent. Don't play so much. Don't talk and laugh. This is a holy time of the year. Francis's family had strict rules and his father sometimes got angry with him for his liveliness. 
In fact, one time his father decided that he would give him a good lashing and said, I'm going to spank Francis for what he just did. And little Francis was indeed lively, but he was also very obedient and smart. When he heard what his father had said, he thought to himself, Well, since he wants to spank me, he'll spank me. So he calmly approached his father and humbly bowed his head so that his father could discipline him, showing his complete obedience. His father, a faithful, good-hearted man, was so moved by his little son's gesture that he said, Go on, get out of here. I can't even spank you because of the humility that you have. Naturally, Francis did not wait for his father to change his mind and left immediately. Later, he gleefully told his siblings, By humility, I got out of being spanked by father. Thus, from a young age, he understood the grandeur, the power, and the worth of Christian humility. This virtue, as we shall see, laid the foundation for the spiritual gifts that he would later acquire as a monk. On August 16, 1904, when he was seven years old, Francis enrolled in the first grade at the elementary school in his village. His teacher was Sophia P., the mother of Bishop Augustinos, who lived from 1907 to 2010, the renowned metropolitan of Florina. Francis was exceptionally intelligent, and he learned the lessons quickly with little effort. The school records, which are still preserved, show that he always received excellent grades. Had he continued in his studies, it is certain that he would have gone far in the academic world. Unfortunately, though, when he finished fourth grade, his father died, and he had to quit school in order to help his mother and his siblings. Family Difficulties on the small barren island of Paros, life was always difficult. The industrious islanders managed to survive by cultivating their meager, meager gardens primarily with grains and vegetables, by raising livestock and by fishing. This is also how Francis's large family survived. But after the death of his father, things became much harder. It was a severe blow to the family and especially to his mother Maria. Her cross was heavy. By the age of 36, she had already lost two husbands and four children. Naturally, the sudden loss of his father caused Francis great grief. Nevertheless, with the passage of time, it had a beneficial effect on his little soul. Little Francis began helping his mother as much as he could so as to lighten the pain and difficulty of widowhood. An orderly and neat young boy he got involved with various little tasks to help his family. Thus his young soul was marked with compassion, a characteristic that accompanied him all his life. Indeed, the future elder Joseph became a man of great love. So great was the family's poverty that in 1914 Maria decided with a heavy heart to send Francis, then 17, and his little brother Leonardo, only 12, to Athens for work. On Paros, there was no way for them to earn a living, whereas in the capital there was hope that they would find a job. As for the rest of Francis's siblings, they all married except for Nicholas, who would later become a monk beside his brother. Two other relatives of Francis became nuns. One of them was the daughters of Ergina, whose name was Barbara, and later became the abbess Veryeni. He loved her very much, and in the many letters he sent her, he called her soul of my soul. The other relative of his who became a nun was Leonardo's wife, Maria. At her tonsure, she received the name Milani and lived many years until her repose in 1997. Section 1 in the World in Athens His New Jobs when the two boys arrived in Athens, they went to the house of their aunt, Alexandra and Lavrio. It is likely that Francis started working in the mines there. Since he had come from a very poor family, he devoted himself to his work with zeal in order to get rich and help his family. He said to himself, I will either get rich or I'll die trying. I'm fed up with po the poverty and distress back home. 
Later, he moved to Piraeus and worked there as a cook and a baker in aristocratic houses. Thus, through his hard work, he began earning some money to send home to his mother. After a few months, he got a job as a ticket collector on the electric trolley. At his job, he was responsible, just, and above all, honorable young man. This was all the result of his strict upbringing and the luminous example of his saintly mother. His behavior as a ticket collector reveals how much his heart despised injustice. All who boarded the trolley paid him the fare, but several of them were in such a rush that they didn't bother taking a ticket from him. Francis could have easily pocketed their money for himself since his superiors would never have known. However, he cut off their ticket anyway and threw it out, thinking to himself, the entire company depends on income from these tickets. How can I silence my conscience and pocket the money? God rewarded him for his honesty. At the end of the day, he frequently found extra money in his pocket, even though there was no logical explanation for it. In fact, one time the extra money was 50 drachmas, which at the time was quite a sum for a poor teenager. It amounted to a whole month's wages in those days. He did not neglect the virtue of almsgiving, since he was very tender-hearted. He gave alms with his whole heart, without waiting for people to ask him. In September of 1915, at the age of 18, Francis enlisted in the Royal Navy and served his mandatory military service of two years. He learned to swim exceptionally well there. He said, if there were ten of us swimming a race, I would beat them all. In the Navy, he was known for his conscientiousness and his excellent record, and for this his commanding officer even rewarded him a watch. After finishing, finishing his Navy service, he began working on his own as a small-time trader. He was active, indefi indefagable, and clever. Thus, in a few months, he managed to accumulate enough of a fortune to become a merchant, yet he never succumbed to the temptation to, to make money by dishonest means when such opportunities arose. Even though his work required him to have dealings with many people, he was careful to live chastely. In fact, his aunt, Alexandra, had arranged for his engagement, but, as he recounted later, I never touched my fiancé because I was afraid that I might reach the point of kissing her. A lion's heart. Francis's one human flaw as a young man was that he could easily get angry. Later he wrote about his younger years. When I was in the world, I could take on thousands. I had a lion's heart. And these words were no exaggeration. For example, once when he, was, when he had his wares set out for sale, he told his brother Nicholas, Listen, I'm going downtown to buy some things. Make sure no one steals anything while I'm gone. Go ahead, Francis. I'll be here. When Francis returned, he immediately noticed that some things were missing. Hey, what happened? He asked his brother. Some scarves are missing. His clueless younger brother was busy playing his violin and hadn't noticed. But Francis was very sharp and he was counting on selling those items to support their large family. <coughs> he asked Nicholas angrily, Who passed by here? Oh, just some Russian fugitives. They looked around and left without getting anything. You idiot! You They stole twelve scarves! You're blind! Where did they go? That way. Francis ran off and found some Russians dividing the spoils among themselves. Without delay, he leaped into the middle of their gang. There were seven of them and only one of him, but he was like a lion. He managed to fight them all off, grabbing the scarves and returned victorious. Here they are, he shouted triumphantly to his brother. One should not be shocked to see that Elder Joseph had this flaw when he was young. On the contrary, we should be encouraged to see that even today it is possible to overcome our passions and reach sanctity as did Elder Joseph. 
Perhaps it was divine providence that allowed him to have such a fiery character in the world so that he could use this force for God. When he became a monk, he said to himself, The way I was a fighter in the world is how I will now be with the demons. Indeed, as we shall see, he did use his strong temperament to struggle fiercely in the arena of monasticism against the passions and the demons. Section 1 in the world is turn towards God, divine visions. By hard work, Francis began reaching his financial goal after only a few months and could see a bright future ahead of him. But God, who wills that all men be saved and come unto the knowledge of the truth, had other plans for him. Seeing Francis's pure life and his heart of gold, God sent him a ray of grace in order to allure him. One night in his sleep, he had had a dream that he described as follows. I dreamt that I was passing by the palace, and all at once two officers of the palace guard seized me and took me up into the palace. I did not understand why and protested, and they answered kindly not to be afraid but to go up since it was the king's wish. We went up into a quite exceptional palace, beyond any palace on the earth, and they dressed me in priceless clothing of pure white and told me, From now on you will serve here and they took me to do obeisance to the king. I woke up at once, and the things I had seen and heard made such a deep impression on me that I couldn't do or think about anything. I stopped work and remained deep in thought. Inside me, I kept hearing that command constantly as if it were being endlessly repeated, From now on you will serve here. My whole inner and outward state changed. Nothing of the things on earth interested me, but I didn't understand what my, dr my dream meant or what I ought to do. Well, one day soon after this, he had great difficulty selling his wares. That evening in his prayers, he complained to God and said, Don't you feel sorry for me? In his sleep, he saw someone with a supernatural appearance who asked him, Who am I, Francis? I don't know, sir. How can you not recognize me, since your heart is constantly meditating on me with warmth? I am the savior of the world. From now on, I don't want you to be here doing business with earthly and temporal things, but to be doing business with souls. You shall go to the barracks from which no one leaves, unless I want him to. After these visions, Francis felt a kind of melancholic listlessness and an aversion towards worldly things. When his landlord's daughters saw his downcast appearance, they asked him what was wrong. In order to help him, they lent him the new collection. This was a collection of the lives of the saints, written by St. Nicodemus of the, of the Holy Mountain. Francis was astonished when he read it. He could not believe that such people existed, people who struggled so intensely for God in their lives and who, with God's help, performed miracles. The great change. God sent his enlightenment to this chaste and honorable young man. The Lord opened his mind, whereupon he started to think about his soul. The words, from now on you will serve here, echoed within him constantly. His first response was to rush to confess his sins to a spiritual father. It was the first time he went to confession in his life, and he confessed with a heart-rendering sobs and rivers of tears. Next, he wrapped up his business as a merchant, since he considered it to be a hindrance to his new spiritual journey. He thought to himself, What do I want the money and the business for? It would be better if I grew spiritually rich. Thereafter, he took on only enough menial work to survive. Moreover, these simple jobs gave him the freedom to occupy himself with prayer while he worked. Indeed, for what is a man profited, if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Like the good merchant of the gospel, Francis abandoned his business in order to find the pearl of great price. As for the money he had accumulated by his hard work, he began giving it away as alms. He arranged for the marriage of his sister Ergina, 
he gave money to his little sister, Maruso, for her dowry. And he gave money to the churches to commemorate the soul of his father. As for his own engagement, he called it off. Furthermore, he went to various shrines in order to strengthen his faith. He visited the monastery of St. Eurasimos in Cephalonia and the Panagia of Tinos when he heard about many miracles from people he met, and especially when he saw some miracles with his own eyes, he realized that the accounts he had read in the new collection were true. When the nuns told him that St. Erasimus passed away on the Dormition of the Theotokos, Francis prayed to him to intercede that the same would happen to him. His prayers were answered forty years later, caring for others. One day he saw a little old nun in the marketplace wanting to buy some grapes. Unfortunately, the poor nun didn't have enough money for them because the price of produce was rising four or five times faster than wages were in those days. When Francis saw her difficulty, he burst out compassionately. Take as many grapes as you want and I will pay. Full of gratitude, the nun joyfully took the grapes to her abbess. After hearing... The explanation about the grapes, the abbess said, Quick, go and tell him to come here. Then the nun went and found Francis and, and brought him to their dwelling. Is there anyone sick here? he asked as he walked into their house. Yes, my child, replied the abbess. There is someone here with tuberculosis. The generous Francis approached her fearlessly, disregarding her contagious disease, and with his whole heart he gave her two gold coins. The sick nun was so moved that she wept. That abbess was Abbess Theodosio of the Holy Monastery of Kekrivunio. When she found out that Francis was considering becoming a monk, she urged him to go to the Brotherhood of Elder Daniel, where, he, where her brother was a monk. His first ascetic struggles. When God saw that Francis had responded wisely to his calling, he set his heart on fire with his grace. Like the apostles Luke and Cleopas, he felt his heart burning and, a, and pining out of love for God. Not able to bear the noise of the city, he went to various isolated places to pray without distraction. He spent time primarily in the mountains of Pentelis which were then uninhabited, and found refuge in the ruins of an old monastery there. Francis probably wanted to go to the holy mountain right from the start, but because of the Balkan Wars, all of Macedonia was in turmoil. Furthermore, in 1918, the catastrophic pandemic of Spanish influenza had broken out in Greece, and those among the living couldn't bury all the dying people quickly enough. Francis's plan of going to the garden of the Panagia would have to wait. Nevertheless, he did not waste time. With his characteristic practicality, he took advantage of his free time to test his monastic calling. Based on his simplistic understanding of monasticism, he tried to live as ascetically as possible. He began to fast strictly by passing the entire day with only a little bread and one or two leukumia. He dressed simply distributed to the poor the little money he still had. Wanting to imitate the stylite saints, he spent the night in trees. Sometimes he went up into the almond tree like St. David of Thessaloniki and struggled ascetically sitting in the branches. He would try to stay awake, praying all night high above the ground. One night, though exhausted by the fasting and lack of sleep, he fell asleep. When he awoke, so much snow had fallen that everything around him was white, and he himself was covered with it. It had covered his mustache so completely that his mouth was frozen, closed. He had nearly frozen to death. But bravely, instead of becoming discouraged, he humorously said to himself, Now, how do I get down from here? For his sustenance, he went into town every day and bought three large leukumia, in other words, half a box. In those days, bakers made, made large leukumia, 
and each one weighed half a pound. One day he had thought, why go into town every day and buy half a box? If I buy an entire box, I will only need to go to town every other day. He tried doing this, but when it was time to eat, he was so hungry that he ate the whole box. It was true that he loved sweets. Then he said to himself, I had better make the extra effort to buy only a day's worth of leukemia every day because it won't work otherwise. With this kind of determination, he gradually began to progress. In asceticism, as he himself later wrote to one of his nuns, When I was in the world in secret, I struggled harshly till bloodshed. I ate only once every two days and only after 3 p.m. The mountains and caves of Pentele knew me as an owl, hungering, crying, seeking salvation. I was testing myself to see if I was able to endure the to to toils and become a monk on the holy mountain. So once I had practiced well enough for a few years, I begged the Lord to forgive me for eating every other day. And I promised that when I would go to the holy mountain, I would eat once every eight days, as is written in the lives of the saints. After living this way for two years, he could see that he was able to become a monk, and he decided to go to Mount Athos at the first opportunity. Meanwhile, the military conflicts had ceased in the Balkans, and travel was again possible. One day when he was in Athens, he happened to meet an Athenite monk from Keriez by the name of Father Onufrios. Francis begged him to take him to the holy mountain. That is how he finally reached Mount Athos in early 1921. Section 2 On the Holy Mountain In Search of a Spiritual Guide First Things First Mount Athos is the easternmost of three peninsulas in northeastern Greece. Steep and rocky, the promontory extends 34 miles in the Aegean Sea, rising precipitously from sea level to 6,700 feet. The craggy peninsula was an ideal place for Christian ascetics. Some evidence suggests that the first hermits appeared there in the 3rd or 4th century. Later ascetics from the edges of the shrinking Byzantine Empire, Asia Minor, Syria, Palestine, Egypt, Libya, fled to the Holy Mountain. Slavic people also streamed in after their conversion. The first large Cenobitic monastery was built in 963, and soon afterwards, many followed. An untold number of saints came out of the Holy Mountain, including martyrs, confessors, hierarchs, and missionaries. Francis arrived at the Blessed Garden of the Panagia less than ten years after it had been freed from the Turkish yoke. It was bustling with life then and had 5,000 monks. Half of them were Greek, while the others were Russian, Romanian, Bulgarian, Serbian, and Georgian. Like all other monastic aspirants who had decided to dedicate themselves to God, Francis also needed to choose the place and the kind of life that would be best match his character. His goal was to become a disciple of an ascetic who kept vigil all night and prayed with watchfulness. That is why he spent less than a month at St. Minas in Keriez and then headed for the wilderness of Manathos. That area includes the steep coastline of the southwestern peninsula of Athos, which is rocky, dry, precipitous, and inaccessible. This is where most of the skeeties and hermitages are located. Young Francis went there seeking a spiritual guide. He said to himself, I will go and find someone who eats only greens and not bread. He wanted his spiritual guide to be similar to the people whom he had read about in the patristic books so that he could be taught the true monastic way of life with heavenly theoria and praxis. As he wrote later, on Manathos we see monks who are doing well and those who are not. The monastic life does not consist of simply leaving the world and coming to Manathos and becoming a monk. That is easy to do. What is of essential importance is to find an elder who will teach us how 
the grace of God is obtained, how it is found, how it is dug up, and how this pearl of great price is revealed. We need to find an elder who will guide us, an elder who will instruct us, an elder who will teach us what the monastic life is. This is why we can deduce that if someone has deviated from the true path, it is because he has not found an elder. And if he himself becomes an elder, what will he hand down to his disciples? Whatever he himself has. The spiritual progress of every Christian depends on finding an experienced spiritual guide. If the wilderness by itself granted noetic prayer, then everyone there would have it. However, practitioners of noetic prayer can be counted on one hand. Why? Because experienced teachers and unerring guides are so rare. The Harsh Reality Soon after young Francis arrived at the Holy Mountain, he realized that the true guides of noetic prayer were becoming scarce. Yet despite the unbelieving difficulties of those times, the Holy Mountain did continue to produce great guides of noetic prayer, such as the discerning elder Ignatius of Katunakia, the famous spiritual father Savas, the renowned Hezekist elder Kalinikos, the well-known elder Daniel of Katunakia, who would become Francis's first elder, Father Joachim Spetseris of, of Nuskid, one blind ascetic whose cell was fragrant when he prayed, and Papa Daniel the Hezekist, whom Francis would receive his Hezekistic program and spiritual guidance. Even though these men who had lived in the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century were of great spiritual stature, they left no heirs to their noetic prayer. This is why the elder Daniel of Katunakia wrote, Unfortunately, nowadays, in the early 20th century, since we do not come to this sacred and lofty way of life with the prerequisites of valiant self-denial and complete denial of the world, and since we do not have suitable trainers, i.e. spiritual guides, we always end up without progress. With Elder Daniel of Katunakia. Following the recommendation of the abbess Theodosia, whom Francis had met in Athens, Francis went to Katunakia to the Brotherhood of Elder Daniel, who lived from 1846 to 1929. He was well known on Mount Athos and beyond. He was a deep thinker and a graduate of the renowned theological school of Smyrna, the same school where St. Nicodemus of the Holy Mountain had studied. The virtuous life of Elder Daniel and his great discernment quickly became known both within and outside of the Holy Mountain. In fact, he had even had a friendly correspondence with St. Nectarius of Aegina. Full of love and wisdom, Elder Daniel became Francis' first spiritual support and guide at the onset of his monastic life. Francis decided to remain with the Brotherhood of Elder Daniel. When they assigned him to read the Psalter during the service, he read very eloquently and without mistakes. Even though he was not well educated, he nevertheless had the gift of eloc eloc dictation. In fact, when he read, he would cry out of great compunction. Elder Daniel, with his characteristic prudence, had decided to lead his small brotherhood on the middle path, neither excessively strict nor too indulgent. He preferred this path because he considered it to be more accessible and safe. Francis, however, was a great struggler. In Elder Daniel's brotherhood, while the other disciples were eating, Francis just sat there watching. The others said to him with concern, Eat, Brother Francis, eat. May it be blessed, he replied, but he did not eat. He did not want to object orally, so he just said the prayer and nothing else. The other fathers would be sleeping while he would be keeping vigil. Since they did not practice noetic prayer, they were somewhat scandalized by his prayer and asceticism, which seemed excessive to them. His respect for Elder Daniel's wisdom knew no bounds. 
but his soul was burning for stillness. Elder Daniel assessed him accurately and realized that Francis was exceptional. Because he was truly full of love and had genuine interest for the spiritual progress of others, he did not want to chop down his zeal by foolishly forcing him to conform, nor did he want the rest of the fathers to be scandalized by his obviously different lifestyle. This is why he told them, My child, life is different here. You are ascetical. You are not well suited to my brotherhood. Go find some cave that you like, and I will see to it that you find a brother so that the two of you can live together. Living alone is too dangerous because you might fall into delusion. May it be blessed, Yananda, Francis replied. Elder Kalinikos the Hesychist Francis moved to a cave less than five minutes away from there, now known as the cave of Elder Theodosius. This cave was so small that only with difficulty could he stand upright inside of it. Nearby lived the famous Elder Kalinikos, who lived from 1853 to 1930. Francis went to visit this exceptional hesychist when he was at the most fruitful period of his life. He was at that time about uh, 67 years old. Francis later described him as follows. He was a first-rate ascetic, a recluse for 40 years. He practiced the noetic work and thrived on the sweetness of divine love and became beneficial to others as well. He experienced ecstasy of the noose. For some reason, however, he did not teach noetic prayer to his disciples. Although he himself was a true ascetic and a God-bearing father, he was not able to transmit his experience to others. Perhaps his refusal to teach noetic prayer to others was a way to discourage people from choosing him as their elder. In this way he would be able to preserve his stillness. Had he accepted to teach them, very many people would have stayed with him because of his great reputation. This would have created many distractions and worldly cares. Anyone who has found grace knows how much orderliness, precision, and restrictions are needed to preserve it. When Francis visited Elder Kalinikos, he asked if he could live near him and be under his spiritual guidance. However, the only advice he would, would give him was to be perfectly obedient, nothing more. May it be blessed, Yerenda, whatever you want, but tell me how I should struggle. And this great ascetic answered, If I teach you the art and you are sweetened by the honey of stillness, who will take care of the daily tasks? So what can I do? Be obedient to me for the time being, and after my repose you will inherit my charisma. Francis looked at him in disbelief and said to him with pain, If I leave here, will you let me come now and then for some advice? Of course, I will be at your service. Francis then returned to his cave and stayed there while trying to learn more about noetic prayer from Elder Kalinikos. But the devil, who hates everything good, was not sleeping. Out of envy he appeared to him in the form of a lion in broad daylight to intimidate him because he could not stand seeing the young man making progress. When Francis saw it, he nearly died of fear since he had never experienced such a thing. He cried out, My dear God, I am under obedience. I am not doing my will. What is this? As soon as he made the sign of the cross, the lion disappeared. Failure to find a guide. Francis was very grieved by the situation in those days, seeing the overwhelming majority of Athenite fathers content with merely attending the typical church service and making handicrafts. Many fathers attached great importance to handicrafts, while a father who practiced and taught noetic prayer was almost impossible to find. Although there were a few who hid themselves, everyone told Francis that the guides of noetic prayer had disappeared. Naturally, there were people on Manathos who liked to teach others merely with words based on book knowledge, just as there are in other places. 
Rarely, however, would they truly exemplify the gospel through their lives. Elder Joseph later said, Preaching is so easy, it is like throwing rocks down from the top of a tall bell tower. Practicing what you preach, on the other hand, is so difficult. It is like hauling those rocks up to the top of a bell tower. Nevertheless, since Francis was so fervent with zeal, he did not give up. He ran to the wilderness and to the caves, to where he had heard that some spiritual people, ascetics and hermits, lived, and he kept searching to see if perhaps there were, were some hidden guides whom the others hadn't noticed, as he would later write about himself. We searched, we shouted, we wept. There was not a single hill or crevice that we passed over in search of an unerring guide to hear words of life, not idle and vain talk. I was looking to find where there was life, where I could benefit my soul. He realized that the saints were vanishing, and that the famine for spiritual words with praxis and theoria had already begun. Of course, there were a great number of strong and dynamic monks, but very few guides. Francis was searching not just for a worker of prayer, but for an ex experienced guide who would lead him safely to find grace in the pastures of pure prayer. It is not enough to find a guide who merely has grace, but a guide who is able to direct others to find grace. This matter is very serious for every monastic aspirant. This is why Francis wanted to be sure, before permanently submitting himself in obedience, that the elder he would choose would be able to teach him the life of prayer. Years later, when he himself had already become an elder, he revealed the following views to a spiritual child of his who was a hermit. The Holy Fathers who teach us to abide in obedience, the highest of virtues, thus imitating Jesus, do so for a purpose, namely to purify us through it from the various passions of high-mindedness and complacency with one's own will, so that we may receive divine grace. But when grace withdraws to test you, the elder, like another grace, supports you and gives you guidance out of his own practical experience. He warms up your zeal to the point that by God's grace and the prayers of your elder, you too are freed from the struggles. Then God's grace lays, lays hold of you once more, and our sweet Jesus entrusts to you his precious treasures as to one perfected. So, there is no other purpose for one to place oneself under obedience. Today, however, everyone thinks that he receives a disciple to teach him a craft, to make money or to dig his vineyard, or to become a merchant and make him an heir to his house, or sell, or shop, or whatever else he has, or even to serve him. We are not, we are not saying not to do things that are necessary, but the main purpose that, is, that a disciple attaches himself to an elder and is perfectly obedient is this. The elder who is flaming with the love of Christ transmits the talent of the riches of his virtue. The disciple in turn enjoys abundant grace from his spiritual father because he cuts off his own will and has perfect self-denial and obedience. Then, of course, he will complete all the household tasks as needed. Despite his diligent search, Francis never found a great ascetic who would be his elder. He did, however, find some ascetics who ate only once a day, though they didn't eat only greens. He found only one ascetic that fasted until the ninth hour. Bodily ascesis is, of course, only one aspect of the spiritual struggle, but based on this one aspect, one can surmise a person's overall spiritual zeal, because he who is zealous in material things is also zealous in spiritual matters. The prevailing indifference Francis encountered wounded his young heart because he did not find what his soul longed for. As he would later write, it makes me feel dizzy just to tell you of the tears and the pain in my soul, the cries that could rend mountains weeping day and night because I did not find the holy mountain as the saints had described it. Nevertheless, he did not just sit around and do nothing. 
he continued searching and circling all of the holy mountains step by step, hoping to find a real ascetic, a person capable of teaching noetic work with praxis and theoria, benefiting from everyone. Francis did find a hesychistic elder, Eurasimos from, from Chios, an amazing ascetic, nine, 90 years old. He practiced noetic prayer. He spent 17 years at the peak of, of Mount Prophet Elias, even though he wrestled with demons and was badly battered by the weather, he remained an unshakable pillar of endurance. He had continuous tears. He let his carefree life sweetened by the contemplation of Jesus. Francis also received advice from Papa Ignatius, who was 95 years old. He was blind and had been clairvoyant, spiritual father for many years. He always gave wise paternal advice such as the following. Whoever works in his youth will have sustenance in his old age. Now when you are young, pray, fast, live ascetically, do prostrations so that you will have sustenance when you grow old. His counsels were precious. The amazing thing was that when he spoke, an indescribable fragrance came out of his mouth due to the prayer that he said noetically without ceasing. So strong was the fragrance that Francis rejoiced talking with him near his mouth. Francis also found another blind elder in Katanaki who constantly said the prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. Sometimes he said it out loud, and other times he said it noetically. Francis went to him for advice and to tell him his thoughts. But the blind elder merely responded, my child, my child, the prayer. Say the prayer, my child. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. Kyrie Jesu Christe, aleis on me. There was an elder in a cave who cried seven times a day. This was his work. He would pass the entire night in tears, and his, his headrest was always thoroughly soaked. His helper went there only two or three times a day. His elder did not want to have him near him, so that he would not interrupt his mourning. Once he asked his elder, Yeranda, why do you cry so much? My child, when man beholds God, he sheds tears out of love and cannot contain himself. Another elder told him that he had given and Dideron to holy ascetics who were invisible to most people. Another one would give them communion while serving liturgy at midnight. One of them had seen the Panagia, and another one had seen angels. All of them were fragrant like holy relics. Later, Elder Joseph wrote, There were, so, there were also many others with Theoria, whom I was not counted worthy to see, because they had died one or two years beforehand. I asked people to tell me about their wondrous feats, because this is what I had occupied myself with. Step by step, I wandered the mountains and caves to find people like this. When he heard about such miraculous lives, the fire kindled within him even more. With insatiable desire, he kept asking how they prayed, what they ate, what they had seen, what they thought. He eagerly ran when they were about to die in order to see and hear what they would say about the divine visions they saw as their soul departed in heavenly tranquility. Unfortunately, all those elders had already reached the end of their lives, and they could not assume the burden of spiritual fatherhood. Another problem in those days was the prevailing general spiritual indifference. For example, Francis once found a blind old monk in the wilderness who had a cat in his arms and was petting it. Francis approached him and asked, Yerunda, why are you holding that cat instead of saying the prayer? The poor old monk, thinking that he would benefit him, replied, My child, I am afraid of falling into, into delusion. But Yerunda, are you on the path of God by just sitting there playing with the cat and not saying the prayer at all? What else could be said? The simple-minded old monk did not understand at all. This is how he had learned, and that is how he lived. 
he thought that saying the prayer led to delusion. People like him continued the tradition of the anti hezekists of the Holy Mountain, the ones who had been influenced by Barlaam and his followers, who had been around ever since the days of St. Gregory Palamas, as well as in the days of the Kolavadis. This phenomenon was very evident in the days of Elder Joseph, and this is why he would later write to a spiritual child of his, Don't tell to many others these things I am writing to you, because people of this age do not occupy themselves with such things. This is why if someone speaks to them about noetic work and prayer, they think that he is talking about some kind of heresy. This, unfortunately, is how the people of our evil age are. Whereas a true monk must occupy himself day and night with the contemplation of God, whether he is eating, sleeping, working, or walking. At that period in his life, in order to support himself, he made small brooms out of wild shrubs. He brought them to the great Lavra, and the monks there filled his sack with rusks in return. But he didn't have any place to keep the rusks. His boulder had a small ledge, so he put them there. He even blessed them with the sign of the cross to protect them. But the forest mice that are extremely agile and eat almost anything found his rusks and ate them all. Even so, Francis did not bother them. On the contrary, he even petted them and said to them, You will not eat those rusks any more. They are mine. Naturally, those uninvited visitors did not listen to him. Francis chased them away every time but those ravenous rodents always found a way to nibble away at a few rusks he had. Of course, this meant involuntary fasting for the isolated ascetic. Nevertheless, instead of getting angry and trying to dispose of the mice using drastic measures, Francis was patient in this trial. He left that cave after staying only a month or two. Then he went to the southernmost part of the holy mountain. Elder Daniel the Hezekist. As Francis continued to explore all the caves, huts, and skeeties in search of a spiritual guide, he discovered a spiritual father near the great Lavra in the cell of St. Peter the Athenite, another elder named Daniel. He was a renowned Hezekist who was about 70 years old. He had been a disciple for 35 entire years before becoming the elder of that cell in 1909. Unfortunately, we know very little about this great Athenite figure because out of humility he chose to live in obscurity. Francis would later write about him. He was a profoundly silent recluse. He served liturgy daily until the end of his life. For 60 years he never thought of omitting the divine liturgy. Even during Great Lent he served pre-sanctified liturgies every day. He died in deep old age without ever getting sick. His liturgy always lasted three and a half or four hours because he couldn't say the petitions due to his compunction. He always soaked the ground in front of him with his tears. That is why he didn't want any strangers to be present at his liturgy so that they wouldn't see his work. But as for me, since I begged him very fervently, he accepted me. At every time I went, after walking three hours at night to attend that truly fearsome and divine spectacle, he told me one or two sayings as he left the altar and immediately hid himself until the next day. He had noetic prayer and all-night vigils throughout his life. It was from him that I also received my schedule and found great benefit. He ate only 100 grams of dried bread every day. He was all wrapped in his liturgy. He never finished a liturgy without the ground turning to mud from his tears. He kept vigil from sunset until midnight using his prayer rope, and after midnight he served the divine liturgy with his disciple, Father Anthony. Many people thought Elder Daniel the Hezekist was deluded because he was so silent and isolated, and because he wouldn't let anyone attend his liturgy. But he knew what he was doing which is why he accepted the criticism silently and patiently. He had many heavenly experiences in his divine liturgies. One time when he had no chanter, 
the founders of Iveron Monastery, Saints John, Euthysimos, and George, appeared in order to help him. He experienced so much grace in his liturgies that he needed an entire hour to recover from the grace. And as soon as he did recover, he would immediately go to his cell to continue weeping from there for hours on end. His great compunction and his silent sobs, which frequently became a wailing lamentation, were a very instructive sight and inspired Francis. Since Elder Daniel the Hezekist could see that Francis was a chosen vessel, he agreed to hear his confessions after liturgy or sometimes before. To save time, he would read his thoughts and respond with a few words full of grace. Grace dwelled in his soul so abundantly that he knew in detail and with precision the secrets of his hearts. This is why Elder Daniel would get to the heart of the matter and give the necessary counsels. One piece of advice he frequently gave them was, St. Synclitiki admitted that the lamp illuminates, but its lips burn. He said this with his whole heart because he was afraid of losing his spiritual state through pride and superfluous talking. Since he was so careful to avoid teaching, Francis benefited primarily from witnessing how he served the Divine Liturgy rather than from his spiritual guidance. Just seeing him serve was enough to give him rest and consolation. As a layman guest, Francis briefly stayed as a guest at the Honorable Forerunner across from the Great Lavra. This is a very beautiful region with rich vegetation and gradual slopes. His ascetical soul found rest in that secluded and tranquil environment. Since he did not yet know anything about noetic prayer, he exerted himself ceaselessly with oral prayer, constantly imploring, imploring help from God. As a layman guest, Francis had the right to live wherever he wanted. So after a short stay at the Honorable Forerunner, he moved on to a place nearby called Vigla, where he stayed for six months at the Hut of the Holy Protection. There he found a little old monk named Hariton, ten minutes away from the cave of St. Athanasius. Father Hariton agreed to give him hospitality in exchange for a small sum, under the condition that Francis would have the freedom to live as he wanted until he found a permanent elder. This little old monk turned out to have a very peculiar lifestyle, as most of the time he was always visiting the various monasteries of Manathos. This routine of his gave young Francis the opportunity to struggle ascetically as much as he wanted and however he wanted. He struggled hard, fasted strictly, and kept vigil. At night, he stood upright or kept walking. In this manner, he pushed himself as much as his human nature allowed him in order to resist sleep. Once, he managed to remain standing for eight days without food water or sleep. He also tried to imitate himself in noetic prayer based on the books he read and the advice he received from the various spiritual fathers. He yearned for it so intensely that he never stopped praying to God about this matter. As it turned out, the little old monk didn't keep his words, and he soon began to deny Francis all his freedom and to conduct himself as if he were his normal elder. He gave him penances and restrictions and behaved harshly towards him. Nevertheless, Francis continued his struggle with patience and fortitude. He tried to comprehend why that little old monk was behaving so harshly and domineeringly towards him, especially since he was still a layman and was staying as a guest in his cell. He was not grieved so much by his harsh behavior as he was with by the unjust restrictions that prevented him from struggling with the prayer. And since he could not find an explanation for this monk's attitude, he started to think that he should go elsewhere. While he was pondering these thoughts, he suddenly burst into tears as he prayed to God with the complaint that although he constantly yearned to find a person to teach him noetic prayer, people did not only not only didn't help him, they even hindered him. Great sorrow. 
From that day on he had the habit of going into the wilderness every afternoon and weeping inconsolably for two or three hours. He would shed so many tears that the dirt would become muddy beneath him. He kept saying the prayer out loud with his mouth because he didn't know how to say it with his noose. Yet he was, yet he kept begging the Panagia and the Lord to give him the grace to say the prayer noetically, as he had read in the Philokalia. When he read such books, he realized that there was something out there that he himself did not have. Once he wanted to invite a priest to bless his room with holy water. After the priest blessed it, Francis brought some tea and sugar on a tray as a treat for the priest. While the little old monk he lived with saw Francis w what he was doing, he struck the tray from underneath with his fist, and everything on it went flying out of his hands. Francis lowered his head, did a prostration, and asked forgiveness. Evlogison, Father, behold the victor. This was one of his first ascetical victories. Nevertheless, the incident disheartened him. The priest tried to console Francis, but Francis left and went to a nearby ravine full of caves, and for ten or twelve hours he wept continuously, not because he was insulted, but because he couldn't seem to find hardly anyone who cared about acquiring prayer. He lost hope and thought, Even in the wilderness I encounter passions. Acquisition of Prayer of the Heart That evening, as night was falling, he had become completely exhausted from the pain and fasting, and his tears dried up. In this state, feebly gazing at the chapel of the Transfiguration at the summit of Manathos, he beseeched the Lord, O Lord, as thou wast transfigured to thy disciples, transfigure thyself also in my soul. Stop the passions and bring peace to my heart. Grant prayer to him who prayeth and restrain my unrestrained noose. As he was praying like that with great pain, a subtle breeze full of fragrance came from the chapel. His soul was filled with joy, illumination, and divine love, and from within his heart the prayer began to flow with so much bliss that he thought to himself, This is paradise. I don't need any other paradise. He saw that the prayer was being said inside him with mathematical precision like a clock. He was amazed that the prayer continued on its own without any effort on his part. As soon as he saw this, he was astounded and said, What's happening to me now? How is the prayer being said within me? I tried so hard for so long and I never felt what I feel now. When he saw that the prayer was continuing and that he felt so much bliss and happiness, he joyfully said to himself, So is this the noetic prayer that I read about in the books of the Philokalia? Is this how it tastes? Is this the light? He then got up, invigorated by this miracle of noetic prayer, went inside the cave and began saying the prayer, synchronized with his breathing, just as the Holy Fathers teach. As soon as he had said the prayer a few times, his noose was immediately caught up in Theoria. It was to be the first of many times his noose was raptured by God's grace. He would later write about this event in the third person, as if it had happened to someone else. He bent his head upon his chest and began eating the sweetness that gushed forth from the prayer that he had been given. Immediately he was caught up into Theoria and was totally beside himself. He wasn't confined by walls and rocks. He was beyond all volition without body, and with a deep tranquility, an extraordinary light, an unlimited breadth. His noose contemplated only this thought, May I never return to the body, but remain here forever. Afterwards, after the Lord had refreshed him as much as he wanted, he came to himself again and found he was in the cave. From then on the prayer which was given to him in such a miraculous manner, did not cease being said within him until his final breath. In other words, he was taught by God himself, just like St. Simeon the New Theologian and many other watchful fathers. Francis was counted worthy of this great charisma at the age of only 24. It is a miracle, 
a great blessing from God for a layman or a monk to be counted worthy of this gift of noetic prayer. In order for this miracle to occur, however, one must induce it by forcing oneself in prayer. Before working this miracle, God waits to see that a person has exerted himself with as much forcefulness as he can, as in Francis's case. First, he fought fiercely with self-denial and utter pain of heart, and then God intervened and worked this miracle. Thus, no one taught him noetic prayer. Instead, he received it directly from heaven, just like St. Maximus of Kafso Calivia and many other great ascetics.